All right, well, we're going to pray our technology cooperates the rest of the service this morning. Uh, they can be your best friend or your worst enemy. But uh, we're thankful that we do have what we have to, to help aid in our gatherings this morning. Uh, we're going to be in the Old Testament today. And oddly enough, last week in the Advent schedule, so to speak, we were talking about hope. But hope is really the message of the word today from the book of Isaiah. So if you could find your place in Isaiah chapter 9, I want to give a little bit of introduction before we read. Isaiah is the longest prophecy in the Old Testament. And that doesn't necessarily make it the most important, but it is filled with importance. This section that we're going to look at today is the fourth and final section of Isaiah's prophecies about Judah. You know, you had a divided kingdom of Israel and Judah, all of God's people. And the interesting thing about today's passage is... There is a lot of discouragement. And I, I, maybe this is what got me thinking about this season. Christmas time is not always happy. There are many things about Christmas that should give us happiness and joy. But it's not always happy. Sometimes things happen in our lives this time of year that we'll always remember this time of year. It's inescapable. And during those times and those thoughts and those feelings, sometimes we need an extra dose of something. Some encouragement, some hope, some joy. And it's in this context that Isaiah is writing to God's people. And they're not having a good day. And they haven't had good days. And there's a lot of darkness. There's some gloom. There's some discouragement. Uh, much of it. Because of their own actions, their own disobedience and rebellion against God and his word. And so I often heard that when I was a child from my, my father, when I'd be griping or complaining about something that was going on in my life. And he would lovingly say, uh, that was sarcasm, in case you were keeping score, that was sarcasm. Uh, lovingly, he would say, well, you just brought it on yourself. You wouldn't do such stupid things. Maybe you wouldn't have these circumstances. And so now the, the, that was not an exact quote, but maybe a paraphrase. And uh, Nowadays, you would hear something like, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Right? That's what happens. Uh, and unfortunately, as silly as that may sound, when you read the Bible, man, over and over and over and over again, a lot of what happens to God's people that's bad they brought it on themselves. They sinned. They disobeyed. They rebelled. They ignored God. And they got the consequences for their actions. And yet, in all that, God was still merciful and gracious and kind and loving and giving chance after chance. Patience is a virtue that God has in perfection that we struggle to exhibit many times. So today, even though we're focusing on the first part of chapter 9, where we will find a message of hope, I want to back up because, as you know, sometimes you can't fully appreciate the good unless you have a really good understanding of the bad that came before it. So I want to back up just a few verses to the final paragraph in chapter 8. We're going to begin in verse 19. And if you'll follow along as I read the words on the screen, if you'd like to follow there, or if you'd like to open up in your own Bible, I encourage you to do that. And we're going to begin reading in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 19, just to, to get a good context here. Here's what Isaiah was inspired to write by the Holy Spirit of God. When they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. 
If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land hard-pressed and famished, and it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray today that you will speak very clearly to our hearts. And as we hear your word, we will understand. And as we understand, we will obey for your glory and our good. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. This text is very interesting. There's darkness, and yet there's a forecast of a great light that's going to shine on God's people. It'll shine beyond the darkness. And it's a sure hope, so sure, that even according to the Hebrew language, as we're going to see this in greater detail in just a moment, it's written in future tense. But it's understood in past tense. In other words, when God's people heard Isaiah prophesy this word, they could hear it and understand it as if it had already happened. Even though it has not yet happened. Their hope was so certain in God. They counted it as reality. Even though it had yet to happen. In fact, as Isaiah prophesied, it would be another 750 years until Jesus would be born as a baby in Bethlehem. And there's two parts of this text. I, I read the first uh, portion there from chapter 8 because I really wanted us to see uh, the darkness that existed when this word was spoken to God's people. Because what's that saying? That... It's always darkest before the dawn. It may last for a moment, but joy comes in the morning. And so as we see the darkness that's over God's people, we have a better appreciation for the light that's coming. And as we approach a celebration of Christmas, a celebration of the birth of the Messiah, I think it's appropriate that we understand what's going on here now i will say this as, a, as we start verse one of our text chapter nine verse one if you were to look in the hebrew bible that verse would actually be verse 23 of chapter eight so it's the ending of the previous paragraph and it serves as kind of a connecting point as we start our text technically in verse two 
So if you look at the paragraph that I read to start off and understand chapter 9 verse 1 is the ending of that and the beginning of the next section. It's a bridge for us, so to speak. It's, a, it's an introduction between the darkness that was before and the dawning of the great light that's coming. And it's been done so skillfully that it kind of just flows together. And so Isaiah speaks of the gloom and the anguish of God's people coming to an end. He prophesies to the people of Judah that God is going to make glorious that which was once treated with contempt. So if you look at chapter 9 and verse 1. There's already a turn, a contrast. You see that conjunction, the very first word, but that always lets us know that everything before that may have been one way, but what's coming after that is going to be different. There will be no more gloom, the Bible says. In earlier times, these lands were treated with contempt, but later it will be made glorious. God will make it glorious. And he's already alluding to the fact that something's going to happen. God's going to do something. He's going to step into our world and he's going to change our circumstances. Now let me ask you a question. If you're sitting here today and you believe in Jesus and you would call yourself a Christian because of your faith in Christ, has God not already stepped into your world and changed your circumstances? <coughs> Is your life not different than it was before? Amen. And isn't that reason to rejoice? Amen. Doesn't that give us a great sense of hope? Even in the midst of darkness in a dark world. See, these people here in Judah were living in uncommon darkness. We have the benefit of looking backward. We see what they had not seen. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The Messiah came to earth in human form. God in flesh. And he changed everything. They had not seen that. And they would not see it for hundreds of years. And yet the hope is still there. Because God said it. You know the old phrase, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. I don't like that. <laughs> you know why? Because I think there's something in there that's not necessary. That little part about us believing it. And that's nice, and that's good, we should. But you know what? How about this? God said it, that settles it. If, if you don't believe it, that doesn't change the truth of what God said. And what God does, and who God is. God is the almighty Lord of all creation. He doesn't need our validation to make him who he is. He, he will always be Lord of the universe, master of the universe. And so the sooner we recognize who he is in light of who we are, then we can understand the faith and hope that exists in his word in the fact that Jesus came to earth to change everything. And he did. So the description of the hope we find in the first part of this passage, verses 1, 2, and 3 in chapter 9, is really amazing. Now we'll say this. Typically, I don't appreciate as much when an when a English translation of the Bible crosses a line over into uh, what I would call interpretation. Let, let me give you an example. Sometimes... Translation committees, when they are taking the original Hebrew text of the Old Testament and the original Greek text of the New Testament, and they are charged with translating those languages into English. Sometimes, those committees, depending on their forms of translation and what they use, sometimes they will say, in the midst of translating, well, this really means this. And so they'll put that in the text. Now, when they say that, or translate that way and say this means this, they're no longer translating. Now they're interpreting. You see the difference? Translating means this word in this language is equal to this word in this language. That's translation. And a little shameless plug here. That is why I read and study and preach from the New American Standard Bible 
because it is the most word-for-word -word literal translation available in English language. Now, it doesn't mean all the other translations are not helpful because they are. But this one in particular, I know what they used when they translated, word for word. So it may not read as easily, but it's word for word. Now, if you interpret, that means you say, well, that really means this. And you put that in there. So you see you kind of crossed over a little bit. You see how that works? Translation, interpretation. Now, so typically, I say all that just to say, normally I'm not a fan of that. I want to I see word for word what does the original text say and then we interpret that in its context so we can get to the meaning of the text. Well, let me just tell you what exists in our passage today. In the Hebrew language, there's two tenses, perfect and imperfect. And if we translate that into English, we can understand what that means and why that's important. Because look at the text in chapter 9, verse 2 and verse 3. What do you see? I see some future stuff that's going to happen, right? Right? I see the people who walk in darkness will see a great light, future. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them, future. Verse 3, you shall multiply, future. You shall increase, future. They will be glad in your presence, right? So all that's future. Well, guess what? All those verbs are in the perfect tense in Hebrew. And I know you don't care about the grammar, but let me tell you what it means. The perfect tense is a completed action with an enduring result. That means we can read that text, and maybe your translation actually reads this way because it has blurred that line a little bit. But in this case, it's completely appropriate. Because here's how we can read that in the Hebrew language as God's people would have understood this prophecy. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Not will see. They've seen it. It's happening. People living in a dark land. The light has shone on them. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased the gladness. They are glad in your presence. They do rejoice as with the gladness of harvest. As they rejoice when they divide the spoil. Th this is a settled reality. God has done it. Even though it hadn't happened yet. Now think about that. How could you hear a statement like that. And have such faith and hope in the source of the information. That you don't hear it as future. You hear it as, oh this is happening. It's a done deal. I don't even have to wonder, is this really going to happen? Oh, no, it's happening. But do you know why they could feel that way and understand it that way? It's not just because of a, a grammatical statement. It's because it was God who said it. It wasn't just a man. It wasn't just an opinion. It wasn't just someone that showed up and said, oh, wouldn't it be nice if this happened? That's not what's happening here. The creator of the universe has just spoken. There is no debate on that. This is going to happen. There is hope that's being described that is going to happen. Specifically, the end of verse 3, there's mention of the harvest. There's mention of uh, the spoils of war. So you have a reference to agricultural abundance. You have a reference to military victory. And you know what that would equate to in this culture? The two things that the people got most excited about. When they plant their crops and it yields an abundance in harvest, that's reason for joy. They're going to be sustained for a, another period of time. When they go into battle and they are victorious... That means to the victor goes the spoils. You heard the phrase? That means when they divide all those wonderful things that they got as a, uh, by virtue of their victory, that's reason to rejoice. The whole nation is elated. That is going to pale in comparison to the joy that comes from this light that's coming from God. The harvest and the military victory, those are nice. 
But when God sends his son into time to be born as a baby and to be the savior of the world, that's a lot better than a good crop. That's a lot better than, well, we won that fight. This will change your eternity, not just your now. Does that make sense? There's a, we talked about it even in, in the context of our prayer meeting the other, the other week. We talked about all these things we pray for and all these folks who are struggling with so many sicknesses and, and medical ailments and surgeries and loss of life and all these things we're praying for. And those are important. They mean a lot. And we want to pray for them. But did you know, as I said the other week, we can pray and pray and pray and someone can be healed physically from a disease and if they're apart from Christ, they'll still go straight to hell. Does, does that not register? Why we pray for people to be healed of diseases and to recover from sicknesses and those are all vital and we want to continue that. But we can't do that in exclusion of praying for real spiritual needs that affect someone's eternity. What good would it do for someone to be cancer free and be without Jesus? So they could live out the rest of their earthly life only to spend eternity in hell separated from Jesus. Y'all understand what I'm saying? It's not that one is unimportant, it's just that one is vital. One is critical to eternity. That's why passages like this are so important because if, if we don't have this prophecy, if this child is not going to be born, if this light is not going to shine, we are without hope forever. Because of this, because it's true, because it is not debatable, because God said it, it will happen. It did happen. That's our source of hope. That's the reason why we can go every day, wake up in this sin-sick world and not just be completely without hope and discouraged. Because we know God stepped into time. He sent His Son into our world. To change everything. That's the light that was shining on those who were walking in darkness. That was the description of the hope that was coming to them. So we get to verse 4. Now there's an explanation of that hope. So you have a description of hope. Now you have an explanation of hope. How exactly is the Lord going to bring about this hope that was described in the first part of chapter 9? The prophet Isaiah looks all the way back to the Exodus when Moses went to Pharaoh. That's the, the fundamental act of God in redemption, the fulfillment of a covenant promise of God to the people of Israel. You shall break the yoke of their burden. Remember when they were enslaved in Egypt? God says the yoke of that burden is going to be broken. The staff on their shoulders is going to be broken. Then he goes a little bit more forward. And he references Gideon. Judges chapter 6 and 7. And the battle of Midian. You see that in verse 4 at the end. The rod of their oppressor is going to be broken. As at the battle of Midian. Verse 5. Every boot of the warrior... In the battle, all the cloaks rolled in blood. It's going to be burned up. Fuel for the fire. And still, in the Hebrew idiom, the way it's understood, God's actions are understood as if they've already happened. They're certain. In other words, you could read verse 4 as, You have broken the yoke of their burden. You have broken the staff on their shoulders. You have broken the rod of their oppressor. Just like he did in the days of Midian. Verse 5. 
speaks of the victory which is going to be secured because of the coming of that Messiah, Jesus. Alec Motyer described it this way. He said, the people enter into the fruit of a victory they did not win. It was the Lord who acted. You know what that reminds me of? The people enter into the fruit of a victory they didn't win. The Lord acted. It reminds me of the Exodus. It reminds me of Moses and Pharaoh. Moses was sent to Pharaoh. Remember that? In the book of Exodus. You remember he was sent. He didn't want to go. In fact, he came up with a list of excuses why he shouldn't be the one to go. Well, I don't know how to talk. I'm not eloquent. I can't go up there to the leader of Egypt and just tell him to let my people go. And then he said, well, who am I supposed to say sent me over here? You remember what God said? I am. And that didn't make a whole lot of sense, did it? But it was right. Because God is. <coughs> Period. I am has sent you. So what, what happened in that story? Remember? What happened? Moses went to Pharaoh. He didn't want to go. He thought he would be unsuccessful. What happened? Plague after plague after plague. Warning after warning after warning. Hey, Pharaoh, how you doing over there? You enjoying those frogs? You enjoying those locusts? You enjoying that river of blood? You still don't want to let my people go? Okay. Plague after plague after plague. Right? Until finally, he didn't just let them go. He sent them away. With their bags full of stuff. So they didn't just leave. They left with all the stuff. And do you remember that last part of the story? You need to celebrate the Passover. You need to institute this offering. And you need to take some blood. And you need to paint your, your door frame with it. Because when the angel of death comes through town tonight. This is so good, I can't wait to say it. The angel's going to be looking for the blood of the Lamb. Because that's going to deliver you from death. Did you hear what I said? The blood of the Lamb delivers you from death. That's the gospel. In the second book of the Old Testament, that's the gospel. That's pointing straight to Jesus on the cross. All those years ago. Because the people are entering the fruit of a victory that they didn't win. Because God did something. It reminds me of David and Goliath. You remember what happened in David and Goliath's story? The Philistines thought it would be cool to badmouth God and his people. And all the soldiers were scared to death. Shaking in their sandals. Wouldn't do anything. Until David came to check on them. And this little kid with a slingshot was the only one who had enough sense to say, how are you going to let them talk about God that way? What are you doing? And they tried to put armor on He said he would go. They tried to put armor on him. He couldn't even hardly walk because the armor was too heavy. I don't need that. I don't need all that armor. And they said, are you crazy? I mean, that's the, the southern Jerusalem translation. Um, so what, what did he do? He took his slingshot, five smooth stones, and he didn't need all of those. You know why? You remember what he said? The same, oh, goodness. The same God who delivered me from the bear. And the lion is the same God who's going to deliver that giant into my hands. David didn't win. God won. When, when are we, we, can, we can read the stories. We're taught those since we're kids. Vacation Bible school, Sunday school teaches us those stories. When are we going to realize David didn't beat Goliath? God did. Moses didn't deliver the people of Israel from Pharaoh. God did. 
The people walking in darkness didn't see a light that was a, a, one of the lights we got out here on our, on our campus. God did something. He shined a light that reset human history. God did it. So when the Bible says in Isaiah 9 verse 6 that there is a child going to be born, a, a son is going to be given, it's understood as a child is born. A son is given. See, the action's not so much about to us. The action is what God did. God gave the son. God gave the child. And the status and the titles of the Messiah tell us all about His authority and His power. The Bible says uh, in verse 6 that the government's going to rest on His shoulders. And then His names. Look at His names. We know this verse. We hear it all the time, especially at Christmas. His name will be called. Now, I want you to, I want you to look at the, the adjectives first and then the names. Wonderful, mighty, eternal, peace. Those are beautiful. But look at the titles. Counselor. Do you ever not know what to do? Do you ever need some advice? We have a counselor who is wonderful. Who always gives us the right advice. He always points us in the right direction. God. A God is someone you worship. But too often we settle for gods that are not mighty. They're just time consuming distractions. Little g. Because a God can be anything that takes your time and attention away from the one true mighty God. It could come in many forms. That's why idolatry is such a big deal. That's why it was at the very beginning of the Ten Commandments. Commandment 1, you will have no other gods before me. Commandment 2, you shall not make for yourself any idols. It doesn't just mean a little statue. It's a lot worse than that. That's why there are commandments 1 and 2, because it's so important. Not everybody's relationship with their earthly father is a good one. Some, some have really good fathers on this earth. And it allows us to look at our earthly father and envision our heavenly father. That's a blessing. That's God's grace. But we don't all have that. Sometimes it's just the opposite. Sometimes our earthly father lets us see everything that our heavenly father is not. And so sometimes we need to take a look at our Heavenly Father who is eternal and know that's what a father is supposed to be in every way. There's a lot of unrest in our world. There's chaos on many different levels in many different subjects and categories in this world. But I am looking toward one who is the prince of peace. Where there is no chaos. There's no confusion. There's no unrest. There's no conflict. There's peace. Always. That's the child that is to be born. That's the son that is to be given. That's the source of all hope 
And it's explained to us so clearly. Not only is that our source of hope, it's never going to end. Look at verse 7, the final verse of our paragraph here. There will be no end to two things. His government and his peace. Isn't that everything that there is, right? So he's in charge, and he's never going to not be in charge. There will be peace, and there will never not be peace. Because there will be no end to it. Now, how, how, do we, how do we understand that in the context of this world we have to live in until we get to his presence? There is no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. To establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. The Bible says in Psalm 97 that righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. So we know that's going to be uh, never ending. And before we think that that's going to, is that really going to happen? Look at the last sentence of verse 7. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. You know another way to understand that title, Lord of Hosts? The Lord of Armies. The Lord of all the heavenly angels, all the mighty warriors. And this is their commander-in-chief. It's kind of a big deal. He's in charge of everything. In other words, I wrote this down. I've already used this word twice in the last minute and not intending to. The Messiah didn't come just to take charge. He came to take over. He is subordinate to no one and no thing. He is the tallest hog at the trough, so to speak. There is no one higher. And he's the one we celebrate at Christmas. But here's the thing. We, we don't just cel celebrate at Christmas. We, we shouldn't just celebrate at Christmas. This prophecy is talking about God's Messiah, Jesus Christ the Lord. And it demonstrates once again this unchanging, unwavering sovereignty and goodness of God, regardless of the difficulties and the challenges that are all around us, despite the sinfulness of this present world, we can still have hope in the God of all creation because He's faithful and true forever. So here's how we conclude that. All this all this truth, all this prophecy, all this reason for hope and celebration, it leads us to an ultimate question. And we all have to answer this question because you can't just read the Bible and just leave it alone. Because when you read the Bible, you are compelled to respond one way or another. So that leads us to a question we have to answer. And we each have to answer this individually. I can't help you with your answer and you can't help me with mine. This is an individual between you and God type of question. What have you done with God's Messiah? Where do you stand with Jesus? Have you believed the gospel? Have you embraced the truth of God's word? Have you surrendered to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Are you trusting in Him alone for salvation and forgiveness of sin? That's like one question with a bunch of parts. But it's all the same question. What have you done with Jesus? And remember, and this is important, to say not now is to say no. It's the, the biggest lie from the devil. You've got plenty of time. And, and you know what? Maybe you do. I pray you do. But the, the fact is, we don't know. So I, this is not a... I, I used to hate this when I was younger. This is not a preacher scare tactic. Okay? Because I'm going to tell you what. You can say yes to me all day long, but that doesn't mean you're saying yes to Jesus. And, and you, you don't have to say yes to me. 
but, but you need to say yes to Jesus. What have you done with the Messiah, the one we're about to celebrate? And, and this is a side note because I, I, I'm, I'm on the verge of, of begging and pleading with you here. If you don't know Jesus, you need to know him. He needs to know you. You need to be in a relationship with him. You need to surrender today if you don't know him. But this is a side note. It, this, is, this is an implication of our uh, response to the gospel. And, and it might hurt your feelings. I hope it doesn't, but it might. If we are not willing to surrender to Jesus and trust him alone for salvation and forgiveness and follow him, follow his word. If we're not willing to do that, if we're not willing to surrender to Jesus, we have no business celebrating Christmas. And that's a harsh truth, but it's a truth nonetheless. If we're going to get together with family, we're going to eat good meals, we're going to give gifts and receive gifts and have a Christmas tree in our house and put up lights and light candles and whatnot. If we're going to do all that, and yet we don't surrender to Jesus Christ, we are living in a lie. And we're just keeping up an appearance that ultimately means nothing. Because Jesus isn't just Lord of a Christmas tree. Let's pray. Lord, I, I, uh, I almost don't know what to say. You, you never cease to amaze me. And the things you do and the way you work and what your word says, I've read this passage probably a hundred times. But it is so filled with meaning. And so filled with truth. And it's vital that we get a grasp on that. So, Lord, I pray today, anyone who may be sitting in this room today or watching online or uh, however they may hear this word of yours, I pray that if they hear your voice, that they would not harden their hearts, but they would respond in repentance and faith and believe in Jesus before it is everlasting too late. You have given us such a, an opportunity to embrace hope and peace. And it's all because of Jesus. So I pray that that truth will be uh, just burned into our hearts and minds in a way where we just cannot ignore it. Help us to have a true, uh, genuine celebration of Christmas this year because of Jesus, because of what you've done. That we would enjoy the fruit of a victory we did not win ourselves. But it's all because of what Jesus has done on the cross. So help us, Lord. We, we always need your help. And we certainly do today. I pray you'd help us. In Jesus' name, amen.